when Michael says lifting the code, it won't be quite that interesting. I'll just be talking about the theories behind teaching and learning. So why am I here? What do I do? Well, I invite speakers for conferences. I help developers talk to each other, and I mess with the heads of students. I started teaching at university in 1998, and I did not know what I was doing. I was teaching algorithms and data structures, you know, big O notation and all that. I knew about that, but I didn't know how to teach. It was like being thrown to the wolves. A lot of the students were smarter than me. Some of them knew more than me. I actually married one of them. But that's a different story. So why are you here? That's why I'm here. Either you're here because you thought you would be listening to Kim Nina. How many of you thought? Okay, good. Otherwise, you can sneak out. Um, so there are three reasons for being here. Maybe you would like to know how to become an expert. Maybe you would like to improve your own learning. We are all knowledge workers, and we still have to continuously learn. And then there's also an anecdote uh, to entertain a dinner party with. It has to be a really geeky dinner party, but I'm sure that you go to some of those. So I want to start with the expert thing. So some of you might have heard about the Dreyfus um, skill acquisition model, right? How many of you heard about this? I'm just going to, like, this is going to be a, a conversation, right? So I'll be asking you a lot of stuff. If you don't want to play along, then just ignore me. It's, I just like it for my own sake, right? So the Dreyfus brothers, one of them being a physicist and the other being a philosopher, found out that the way to become an expert is actually the same no matter what it is that you are learning. So they worked on this and then created this together. And I think they published it in 1980. Uh, what it says is that when you want to become an expert, there are different steps that you need to take. You start out being a novice. You only understand the context-free rules. Like, perhaps you've read about Scrum, and you know what the meetings are and what a backlog is. Then you start watching presentations with people who have actually implemented what it is that you know. And, and from other people's experiences, you learn some guidelines, and you can now start to apply these guidelines. You're now a, a beginner in this. You know that sometimes, even though it says so in the book, you can actually do something a little bit different. Then you start applying it yourself, you start working with it, and you become competent. You no longer just follow the rules and the guidelines, but you can actually respond to the unexpected. You move on in your learning, you start discussing your experience, you formulate your problems yourself, you try to understand why things are happening, and you become proficient. And I have yet not figured out how to make this text shorter, so I'm just going to read it. Unconsciously combines processes and response for nuances of situations. If anybody can make this shorter and still understandable, that'd be great. So you become proficient. That's what most of us are when we get promoted. We can actually do things that people don't expect us to do. And once we've done it again and again and again and again and again, we become experts. And we now have an intuitive grasp of the situation. An expert is what we all want to be, right? We want to become an expert in this and an expert in that. There's a lot of courses that can create experts. But being an expert is not necessarily the best thing to be. I don't know if you've ever taken a course where the teacher was an expert. I know I have. And the trouble with experts as teachers is that they are up here, where it says intuitive. They might have forgotten the rules and the guidelines. They have forgotten what it is that's hard to understand. I remember I had some PhD students as teachers in some of my courses, and I couldn't understand what they were saying, and they couldn't understand what I was saying. So if you want to become even better than an expert, you have to teach. Because when you teach, 
you learn how to go down to the different levels. You learn how to talk to somebody who's only competent or even a beginner. You can understand what they understand, and you can start building them from there. So if you want to really be good at something, you should teach it. The first company I worked for after my own PhD was a little company in Denmark, and, uh, and they really believed in this to the extent that when I said I wanted to learn how to program Java, what they did was that they sold a Java course, and they made me the teacher <laughs> in three months. It was really motivating. I can not recommend it at all. But this thing about being an expert, there's been a lot of research into what is it that makes experts apart from these different steps. And one of the things that has been worked on a lot in the research is chess. Because in chess, it's very evident who's a novice and who's an expert. How many of you here know the rules of chess? How many of you play chess? How many of you is an expert in chess? Oh, don't worry, there's no extra questions for you. But you probably have some ideas about what is it that makes an expert, what is it that makes a novice in chess. Is it because they have a more breadth of more steps to take? Is it because they can look further into the future? What is really the difference? So a lot of research where they've looked at the experts and novices looking at chess boards and playing chess and trying to follow their eye movements and see how many elements are they looking at, how long are they looking at them, how many different steps are they thinking about. I'm not going to talk about any of that. I'm going to talk about a different study where they took a lot of expert chess players and they took a lot of novice chess players and they let them look at a mid-play chessboard with all the elements for a few seconds. And then they had an empty chessboard with the pieces, and they had some time to put the pieces on their own board. They had a little bit more time to look at the mid-play chessboard, and then they had some time to like, improve their own chessboard over here. The same for the novices. Now, I, I wanted to do some fancy menti, but it didn't happen. So it's, it's going to be old-fashioned. I'd like you to think about who do you think performs best in this, about putting the right pieces on the board when you have a chance to look. Do you think that the expert is better than the novice? Then you raise your hand now. Is the expert better than the novice? And again, you can just ignore me. If you think they're the same, equally good? Yeah. If you think the novice is better than the expert? OK. Wow. Well, I like diversity. So uh, this is what happened. The novice chess players could, could put about four pieces in the right place after looking at the board the first time. The experts could put about 16 after looking at it one time. And you can see that the novice like then goes to 8 and 14, 16, and, and the expert is actually accelerating. So getting, there's a, there's a huge gap between those two. Let's not talk about that right now, because we want to talk about something else first. Now, they did the same with a random chessboard. Exactly the same thing, random chessboard. So this is uh, my own chessboard at home, where I used the uh, JavaScript's uh, random method to put the, put the pieces there, because there's nobody in my home that doesn't understand the rules of chess. And what do you think now? Do you think it's the same, or do you think it's different? Let's hear from you. How many of you think the expert is still better than the novice? How many of you think that they're probably the same now? How many of you think the novice is better than the expert? Right. So what happened was that with the random chessboard, not surprisingly, the novice is doing exactly the same. The novice can put about four pieces after watching the first time, the next time about seven, the next time about 14, 16, exactly the same picture as before. But what is happening to the expert? Anybody wants to say what they think is happening to the expert here? Yes? Exactly. The expert is searching for the patterns, but he cannot find them. Because when you are an expert in chess, 
what you have is a lot of patterns and pattern matching or schemas and automation. And when you are a novice, you don't know a lot of board configurations and you don't have that automation. So the expert is spending a lot of energy searching for patterns that are not there and that's tripping them over. Now, let me give you another example. When you can read this, then please raise your hand. Yes? <laughs> Good. Yeah, get it. The morning newspaper is coming late. See, what happened here was that I took something that you're an expert in, that's reading, and I tripped you over a little bit by turning it around and making the spaces in different places than you expect them to be. And that's very interesting that when you are an expert in something, it can actually be very difficult to, to do something where it doesn't follow the rules exactly. And I'll give you an example of that later from my own life, but I want you to think about that for a while, to think about the patterns and the automation. Because I want to talk about how we learn as well. So chunks of information, patterns and automation, learning preferences and constructivism is what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk about it as a little story. So imagine that you get an apprentice in, uh, in, your, in your organization and you want to turn that apprentice into an expert in the system that you work on, on the, or the process that you work on. So you talk all day and you use a lot of examples. You're like, look, this is how we do this, this is how we do that. This, like, let me show you again. But the apprentice doesn't get it. Is the apprentice stupid? Perhaps, perhaps not. Let's look at the brain. So what is this a picture of? This is a picture that shows why I'm not into any creative uh, work. This is a nose. Uh, this is a long-term memory and the, short, and the working memory, or the short-term memory. And um, the reason why there are four elements in the working memory is because this is the active part of our brain. This is what we can work with. And previously, when I was young, the research said that you could juggle about seven plus minus two concepts at a time. Now we're down to four. Are there any young people in the audience? Uh, it's probably not because you've become more stupid. It's just probably because the, the research is better. So what happens when we learn? Well, first, we use our working memory. So we think about things. We hear things. We see things. And we try to put them together in our working memory in different ways. And when one of the things that we are thinking about can be connected to something in our long-term memory, the things that we know, the things that we understand, we can actually decode that into the working memory. So you notice that, of course, when you hear a word or you hear something, you, you get a lot of feedback from your long-term memory. It reminds you of things. Oh, that's like when I did this, or that's a bit like uh, databases, or that's a bit like something else. And then what happens is that once you have decoded that from the long-term memory, you're working with it, you're processing it in your working memory, and then when you worked a little bit with it, you're encoding it back into your long-term memory. So it's like when you hear something new, you take that pattern from your long-term memory, you make it a little bit more delicate, or you correct some things, and then you put it back in your long-term memory. And in that way, we can learn about things that are more complicated than just four concepts put together. It is because the brain works in that way that when we take a pattern from the long-term memory, it acts as just one element in the working memory. And that's a bit like patterns. You know, patterns is, is a way to describe experience. It's a, it's a way to describe something that is complicated. And patterns always have a name. So it's like a little link to, to the whole pattern understanding. And patterns is not just a good way of learning, but it's the way that we learn. It's the way that the brain stores this information as patterns, complicated structures in our brain that we can pull out when we need them. So one example is the visitor design pattern. Now, 
I spend a lot of my time working with design patterns and language constructs, and, and the visitor design pattern is one of the more complicated GOF design patterns. But if you know the visitor pattern, I don't have to explain to you, oh, so we had this visit method, and it calls that accept, and then the accept returns this value. I can just say visitor, and then you know what I'm talking about. So not just is it a way to help our brain remember things, because now it has the visitor label, it's also a way for me to communicate with other people on a higher level of abstraction. So that means that once I've learned it, I can apply it pretty easily. And I want you to think about, but you don't have to answer, what are the patterns in your workplace? I'm sure there are some. I've asked this question to a lot of people, and some of them are saying, we don't have any patterns in our workplace. These golf design patterns, they're so ridiculous. We, ugh, we are above that. But once I talked to somebody from uh, Google, and I got that whole song again about how ridiculous that is. I asked them, so, but don't you have anything that you sort of do all the time, that you give a name, that you tell the apprentices? And he was thinking hard about that, and then he said, actually, we do have something that we call the double bottleneck. Ah, I said, oh, this is promising. What's a double bottleneck? Well, he said, we are very much into optimizing things to make it run faster, right? And when we see that the it's not as fast as we think. We want to remove the bottleneck. But when you have an idea that something might be a bottleneck and you want to remove it, it's sometimes very difficult to remove that bottleneck. You might have to make a whole change in your system to optimize it. And then it might not actually be the bottleneck. It might be something else that was just shadowed by that. So what they're doing instead of trying to remove it is that they double it. So if it's a call for a database, they do that twice. If they're running an algorithm, they do that twice. And then if the time gets a lot worse, that's more likely the bottleneck. And then they can remove the original bottleneck. So that's just an example of a pattern that they didn't even think of as a pattern, but that they were explaining to people. So I'm sure that you have patterns. But what if the apprentice still doesn't get it, even if you use patterns? Is the apprentice stupid? No, not necessarily. Let me tell you about the first time I was at teaching in private industry. So I was a fairly young woman at the time, teaching some middle-aged men. At that point in time, I thought middle-aged was really old. I don't really feel that anymore. But uh, I was supposed to to tell them about object-oriented analysis and design and Java programming, because Java programming was very new and hot at the time. And I was, of course, uh, using Rational Unified Process, which is a waterfall process. I was young and I needed the money. So uh, that's what can happen. And, and uh, I knew that uh, I knew how OO worked. I mean, I had been using object-oriented analysis and design since I started programming, which was at university. So, to me, the exercises that they should make, it was a four-day course, it was super easy. I mean, and I've even, I'd been told that they were smart, but they, they couldn't do it. So I had expected them to just look at this problem domain, create some beautiful O design, and some nice code. So I gave them this assignment, I said, this is your problem domain, it was probably a, uh, yeah, a payment system or something like that. And, and I expected them to do something nice like this, you know, like round, object-oriented, beautiful code. But instead, what they came up with was this terrible blur. The methods were out of the classes. There were methods outside the classes. It was really ugly. I couldn't understand. Because I told, I'd been told that they were intelligent, and now they were being so terribly stupid. You know, the first time, I just thought, it was probably a bad batch of developers. <laughs> that happened sometime. I'll try again next time. Same thing happened. And I thought, this, like, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice. Or oh, is it the other way around? I don't remember. So I thought, there's something rotten here. And then I, I realized that they had a procedural brain. Like, they were experts in programming in the procedural paradigm. And that meant that whenever I gave them a task, their expertise would just 
spit out a perfect procedural program. But what I wanted was for them to do something completely different. So I thought, hmm, smart. I'm just going to tell them that they should forget everything that they know. <laughs> and that didn't work either. So what I found out was that if you, if you want to break that expert problem in people, you have to divide the problem into smaller problems so that they don't recognize, the brain doesn't recognize the pattern. So instead of giving them a problem domain and making them come out with code, I would break it into create a UML or an OMT diagram and to, to, to sort of not get them to jump to code, and then uh, a sequence diagram, and then a state diagram, and then in the end, they would be allowed to implement it in Java. And that helped. But you have to break that expertise. You have to give them a problem that they don't recognize, that they cannot solve, because otherwise they'll just solve it like that. And that leads me to my second point, made by the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard, I'll read it aloud. At man, når det i sandhed skal lykkes en at føre et menneske hen til et bestemt sted, først og fremmest må passe på og finde ham der, hvor han er, og begynde der. Now it's old Danish, so you might not understand. <laughs> so I translated it to English so that you uh, understand. But the, basically it is, if you want to teach anybody anything, you need to figure out what they know already. You need to figure out where they are and start there. As I showed you with the expert and the teaching, you, they have to go down to that level. Because if you start teaching up here, they won't understand and it won't change them. Right, so what if the apprentice still doesn't get it? Even when you find out where they are, now they must be stupid, right? This is actually a build-up for the next talk by Claire Sotbury about people not being stupid. But anyway, there can be something else wrong. So, in Denmark, we talked a lot about learning styles. Now, the research says that we shouldn't talk about learning styles because it's not so that everybody needs to learn with music or sitting down or touching things. But learning preferences is still kosher to talk about. And one of the things that surprised me when I started doing research into how teaching works 16 years after I started teaching. Um, 16 years after I started teaching, I, I understood why things worked and why they didn't work. And one of the things that made me understand it was this um, Felder Silverman model that shows the difference between global learners and sequential learners. So global learners, they're all the way on this end of the spectrum. They understand the global view initially. They understand everything at once. They see why this is important. They understand the relations to other things that they know and other things they need to know. It just goes like this. At the other end of the spectrum, we have the sequential learners. The sequential learners need to learn all the nitty gritty details, otherwise, the global picture is just completely waste of time. And of course, it's a spectrum, so you can be anywhere from here to there. But it turns out that I am very much a global learner, which probably explains why I'm so interested in patterns and software architecture and teaching and things like that. And that means that when I was teaching, I was teaching in a way that I thought would be great. So I would give them the big picture, I would motivate, I would make relations, and the people who were sequential learners in my audience, they would get more and more frustrated because I wouldn't talk about the details. I wouldn't talk about like, but why does that work like that? And how do you create this algorithm? And, and I wanted to talk about the big things because I thought, well, when, once you have the big things, you'll be motivated to learn the small things. So, what I'm thinking now is that when you are teaching, or giving a presentation, or explaining anything to anybody, perhaps think a little bit about, are you a global or a sequential learner? And could you perhaps explain the things that you want to explain in a little bit different way? Last time I gave this talk, a woman came up to me afterwards and said, this will save my marriage. <laughs> so I hope you listened. Another thing that can be interesting to think about is the difference in the spectrum between the reflective learners and the active learners. So over here, we have the reflective learners. They need to reflect in order to learn. They need a little bit of quiet time on their own to think 
in order to learn. If you continuously tell them things for 45 minutes without giving them any breaks, they'll just stop listening at a time. Because they need time to have that connection between the working memory and the long-term memory where they don't say anything or do anything. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have the active learners. And they need to do something, to say something, in order to learn. You've probably been in meetings with active learners or active thinkers. An active thinker cannot think unless they talk. That means that quite often they haven't thought before they're talking, right? So you probably have been in meetings, and maybe some of you feel like you are actually an active uh, thinker. Where, and, but I, I think it's a good idea to think about where are you on this spectrum, and perhaps act accordingly. A lot of meetings where everybody is a plenary discussion drowns in active thinkers, and the reflective thinkers don't get to say a thing. It also drowns in global thinkers who immediately can see all the relations and talks about that while the sequential learners are thinking about the little details and never get to say anything. So if you want to involve the sequential thinkers and the reflective thinkers, you should make some breaks where they have a time to think and time to think about the small nitty-gritty details. So try not to have just plenary discussions in your meetings. Try to have a little bit of plenary, divide them out into smaller rooms and get them back again. And that way you can make full use of all the brains. Now what if the apprentice still doesn't get it? Now they must be stupid, right? Yeah. But it could also be, it could also be, um, that there is a problem with the, the way that they're learning. So Jean Piaget uh, made some research about learning, and he coined a term called constructivism. That means that you construct your own knowledge. So previously, when people need to learn something, we've had a lot of focus on the teacher and the subject that they need to teach. So the teacher is thinking about, how can I explain this subject in a good way? How can I? How can I make them understand this and put it together with the other things? And that's a good idea. But the learning, the real learning that sticks only takes place if the student are constructing their own learning. So here's an example of something you probably have tried. So you are explaining something to somebody, right? Something about the um, software system, something about the process. Maybe you're explaining. Um, how to add pictures to emails to your mother-in-law, or something like that. And it goes very well, and they can do it, right? You're asking, so yeah, now you do it, and they do it, and you're like, I'm such a great teacher, they can do it, how amazing am I, right? And you talk to them next week, and it's gone. Completely gone. You do it again, and it's completely done. I, you don't understand. Other people are telling you they've also taught this person this particular thing, and they were also really good teachers, but now it's gone. Why is it gone? It's gone because of constructivism. The only way to make things stick in your brain is to add it to something that they already understand. Because when you are sleeping, in the light sleep, the brain is in going out and optimizing the synapses for all the things that are important for you to survive with. It starts with survival, and it, it moves out to things that are connected to the things you already understand, and the things that you're doing again and again must also be really important, so the brain works on that in the light sleep. That's why sometimes when you sleep, you dream about things that you're learning at the moment, because the brain is trying to drill this in, all these patterns and automations. But in the deep sleep, what happens is that the brain is doing a mark and sweep garbage collection, or something. That's not what it says in the book, but that's how I think about it. It's, it's sort of, and I don't know whether it's removing the stuff in the brain cells or whether it's not, just not supporting the synapses. But if it's not something that is already connected to what you know or something that you've done a lot of times, the brain just decides we're not going to spend any energy on that because the brain uses a lot of energy. So the encoding only works by construction. So if you want to explain anybody anything, you need to figure out what they already have and build on that. And that is why when I was 
studying computer science, all the examples was about football, cars, and beer. <laughs> and I had just one night's sleep, and it was all gone. Because it was not connected to anything that had any meaning for me. So when I was teaching Java for the first year students, I was using baking as an example. <laughs> See who forgot things then. <laughs> but what if the apprentice still doesn't get it? Now they must be stupid. Right, yeah. Some of you are still awake. Uh, what if the apprentice doesn't want to listen to you? And then it doesn't really matter how well you're saying it, how good you're saying it. So some of you might know what this is. How many of you know what this is? The Aristotle modes of persuasion, lots of years old. It's not new research, this logos, pathos, and ethos. And when you are going to talk to somebody about something, you should think about these modes of persuasion. So the first thing is logos. Know what you're saying. Like, do you actually understand what it is you're talking about? And I'm not saying you should be an expert. Actually, it's better if you're not an expert. If you're only competent or proficient, much easier for you to go down on people's level that are novices and beginners. So it doesn't have to be the one who's best at it. Maybe they cannot answer all the questions, but they can understand the questions, and then they can find the answers. Pathos, how excited are you? Like, do you actually find this interesting that you're talking about? Because I find this very interesting, and I think you can sense that on me. But you should have heard me when I gave lectures about databases. That was dreadful for everybody in the audience. You can fake this pathos, and you can perhaps become motivated. But it is something to think about. If you're not the one that's most interested in this, maybe somebody who knows it a little bit less, but who is actually motivated about this would be better. And then ethos, who they think you are. When you are at a conference like this, you're sort of expecting me to know what I'm talking about since I'm up here, right? So I have a, yeah, maybe not. But I have a little bit of ethos to start with, right? But if I met you at, a, at, a, at an organization, I might not have the ethos. Uh, to convince you, to convince a team, to convince managers about something. So sometimes it can be a good idea to talk a little bit about why it is you who's talking, and that is why I started out by saying I've been teaching since 1998. Some of you might even have been born after that, I don't know. But uh, I just wanted to show you that I've actually done this a lot. So what did you actually listen to? What did you spend this time on when you are lying on your deathbed and you want another 40 minutes with your loved ones? Think about this. This was not wasted. We talked about how to become an expert. We talked about how to improve your own learning. And the anecdote to entertain a dinner party with was, by the way, the one about chess. So that's what I had. And I stupidly left some time for questions. Yes, you did. <laughs> and we've got really easy ones. So let's start with the first one. It actually seems that most school education systems are geared towards sequential learners. So doesn't that leave the global learners out of the picture? Definitely. I completely stopped going to school when I was allowed by my parents. Okay, that was a... <laughs> Obviously, that was really an easy Yeah, yeah, question. I mean, really. I, I mean, I, I, the, the primary and secondary school, in secondary school, I, I just couldn't listen, so I stopped going to school. My parents were okay with it. The teachers said, okay, I went to high school. They almost threw me out three times because I didn't go, because I couldn't. And then, uh, wonderfully, at university, I didn't have to, so I could just do it on my own. And if... If I had like, lived in a time like it is now, where, where everything is recorded on video, I think it would have been easier for me, because then I could find the snippets that I need. I, I did not understand anything until two or three weeks before the exam, where I got the full picture. 
and then when I got the full picture, I could put in the details. But before that time, I just did other things. I got three children. <laughs> <laughs> Seemed to have worked out quite nicely for you, doesn't it? I think so, yeah. Um, well, when we're talking about the learning styles, mm -hmm. um, how do you actually find out the learning styles of the people you're talking with, of your colleagues or yeah. whom you're addressing? Well, there is a test you can make them take. It's a bit like... But I guess that the important thing is not to figure out you're a seven or you're a five or you're a two. I think the important thing is that you reflect on this. And then if you see that people don't understand what you're saying, you can use that reflection and say, OK, I am quite sequential. Maybe I should motivate a little bit more before I start talking. Or on the other hand, like I, I am quite global. Maybe I should give them some nitty gritty details to keep them happy. That's definitely how I use it. But I'm quite sure that you've all thought where you are on the global sequential scale without even taking that test. Just picking up on that, do you have any tips for oneself? How could I pick up on my own learning style? Yeah, well, I, I think it's important when you want to learn something that, that you figure out why you want to learn something and to which level you want to learn it. I think a lot of people start learning things thinking they want to become experts, but that's not really a good way to start. I think it's a good idea to, to reflect on where do you want to be on the Dreyfus um, scale of skill acquisition, because there are some things where you're okay just to be competent. There are some things where it's okay just to be a beginner. So I think just reflecting on where you want to be, but also reflecting on uh, right, if I don't understand this, instead of thinking, I'm stupid, I'm stupid, I'm stupid, think about the things I said. Think about constructivism. Ask the teacher for examples that relate to you. Think about like the motivation or whatever it is you need. Okay. Before I come to the last one, which is regarding your ELO chess rating, and I don't even know what an ELO chess rating is. <laughs> you do? No. Okay. But I can guess, so, so and I don't I'll have any. That question. I, I won't answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. ask that. But you mentioned that the process of correct encoding is essential yep. to keep the information. How about the retrieval part? Do you need to retrieve it often, or yes. do you don't need to retrieve it at all if you encoded it well enough? I guess that's the meaning. Yeah, well, uh, mm, that's an interesting question. I, I am not sure I have a 100% answer to that one, but I'll explain to you how I understand. I think it relates a little bit back to how can I help myself. You know that when you talk about like data structures, you often think about should I choose a data structure where I just put everything in in a mess, it's easy to put things in there and then it takes a little bit more time to find them again? Or should it be something where I put it in precisely where I want it and then it takes me a lot of time to put it in but it's easy to get it out? And I think you can think about this for your learning as well. If you're learning some new concepts, if you're learning something new, try to see if you can find the patterns. That will make it easier for your brain to retrieve that information later. If you just like read seven books in a row and don't sleep for a week, it will be a mess in there. So try to reflect on the patterns that you've learned. I think it will make it easier for you to retrieve the information. That works for me, but I'm also really geeky about patterns, so, yeah. Okay, so I'll skip the ELO question. Yes, please. <laughs> and conclude with a big thank you. Thank you, Michael. That's it. <laughs>